Welcome, everyone. Good evening. I see you guys are connecting. Good deal. Welcome to our Thursday night at the museum with the Birmingham Museum. Welcome, welcome. I see some familiar faces and some familiar screen names. If you guys wouldn't mind muting yourself. Um, so once we get started, um, we don't hear any dogs barking or phones ringing, that would be great. Um, my, my name is Jen Hassel. I am one of the adult services librarians at the Baldwin Public Library. Um, thanks for joining us. While everyone gets connected and gets their uh, audio settings set, um, I'm gonna promote a couple of upcoming events. Um, right now we are still virtual for the adult programs. Um, I'm gonna throw a few links in the chat and then we will, um, we will uh, turn things over to Donna Cassicelli from the Birmingham Museum for tonight's presentation. Um, one of the things I think you guys might be interested that's coming up in the, um, in the very near future is um, the Sarah E. Ray Project, Detroit's Other Rosa Parks. It's on uh, March 14th. And it is, um, again, uh, going to be virtual. Um, I didn't know anything about this woman. I, I still don't. But I, when I saw that one of my coworkers booked it, I thought that it sounded like a, a fascinating, uh, fascinating talk. Um, so there's a link there in the chat if you're interested. These events are all also, of course, at our um, on the events page. So if you don't quite uh, get around to clicking on that, um, you can go to our, our calendar for the at the Baldwin Public Library's website and um, click on it there and register that way too. No pressure. Um, and here's another one that was a, it's about um, I thought it was about missing people, but when I saw the link uh, the other day, I saw a shipwreck. Uh, so this is still missing Michigan's mysterious disappearances. Um, yeah, I thought it, I thought it was a missing persons. It doesn't seem to be that. Again, one of my coworkers has that going on um, uh, March seventh, which is just next week. Um, and then the last one I'm going to throw in there, uh, and I know Donna will talk about this at the end of the uh, presentation, is the April um, uh, museum program. This one is uh, uh, I did not know this. Birmingham, America's Shetland pony capital. So who knew? I did not. <laughs> um, so that's on, uh, am I going to say it right? Is it April 7th? Yes. Yep, April 7th. So there's a link for that in the chat too. Um, for any of uh, those events that you want, you can click on those links. And I'm going to make sure we've got everybody in, all of our participants. Nobody's hanging out. Nope. We've got everybody. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Donna. One quick thing, uh, if you have questions, um, you can throw them in the chat while Donna's talking or you can hang on to the end. Into the end. I will be monitoring the chat and we'll make sure there's time for Q&A at the end of the program. With that, I will turn things over to Donna. All right, well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to uh, the Birmingham Museum's presentation of Birmingham Women in Aviation. Um, I just want to note that when we started, uh, this was really a program that was started uh, by accident. Um, basically what happened is in 2019, uh, I received a call from Roberta Rowe and she was a former Birmingham resident from one of our older Birmingham families. Uh, she told us the story about her mother, Edna Ferguson, uh, and her mother was a pilot and was one of the pioneer women aviators in our area. Of course, this was quite intriguing um, because we didn't know that Birmingham had an aviation history. So when we decided to start researching Edna's life, we were pretty much all here at the museum intrigued with her story. And that story kind of led us to other women aviators in Birmingham. What we found uh, was fascinating, very exciting, and in some cases, tragic. Uh, I'm happy that you are joining me tonight uh, for our talk on these wonderful women aviators. So before we get to Edna Ferguson and her experiences, we need to understand the beginnings of aviation and the people who influenced early flight. 
So right here, you can see a picture of Catherine Wright and her very first flight with her brother Orville Wright, or uh, brother Wilbur, and Orville is standing off to the left. And this is in uh, France. Now, most of you have probably heard of Wilbur and Orville Wright. Um, they are the ones who invented the first working airplane, uh, but most people haven't really heard of their sister, Catherine Wright. Catherine actually spent most of her life helping her brothers achieve their dreams of taking to the sky. She was instrumental in supporting their endeavors, both physically and financially. She managed the bicycle shop. She represented the notoriously shy brothers to the public. She took care of the bookkeeping. She paid the bills. Um, and she did all of this while still uh, keeping a steady job as a teacher. Uh, she became just as big a celebrity as her brothers and was actually awarded the highest civilian honor in France for her contributions to flight. We're not looking good. I'm sorry? Oh. oh. <laughs> well, she managed the bicycle show. Oh. So, but anyway, she, she became just as really famous as her brothers. Now, after Wilbur died, she became an officer in the Wright Company and took care of Orville throughout the rest of his life as well. Orville would never marry. Unfortunately, throughout history, uh, she was basically forgotten and never written in the history books. Uh, it's only really been in the last decade or so that her contributions to flight have been recognized. So we wanted to make sure that you knew about Catherine, Catherine Wright because she was at the very forefront of human flight, just like her brothers. Now, this is a photograph that would inspire millions to take to the skies. This is December 17th, 1903, and the first flight by the Wilbur brothers. Now, according to the National Park Service, and I am quoting this because it's very exciting. At 1035, Orville released the restraining wire. The flyer moved down the rail as Wilbur steadied the wings and just as Orville left the ground John Daniels I do want to make a note not our John Daniels um but the uh the Don, John Daniels from the life-saving station he snapped the shutter on a preset camera capturing the historic image of the airborne craft with real Wilbur running alongside so it was a very exciting picture it was a very exciting time in American history and of course, this would just capture the imagination of not just men, but women as well. Now, the first flight was into 27 mile an hour winds. So the ground speed had been about 6.8 miles for a total airspeed of 34 whole miles per hour. Of course, there was three more flights that day and the last one ended at an impressive 852 feet in 59 seconds. So, I mean, we can look at that and be like, wow, that was really slow, but they got it off the ground and that's what was important. And of course, this would just spark the imaginations all across the United States. Now, the next woman that really makes a mark in the history of flight is Harriet Quimby. And she was actually a Michigan native. Um, less than eight years after the very first flight, Harriet Quimby became the first woman to get a pilot's license. She was a journalist at the time and she basically took lessons to write an article, but she fell in love with flying and gave up journalism. Just a few months after getting her pilot's license, Harriet Quimby became the first woman to fly across the English Channel. She was famous for participating in several races and shows and became a national spokeswoman for Vin Fizz Soda. So the idea of, you know, popular people becoming spokespeople for pops and sodas is uh, very long running. But just one month shy of her one year anniversary of getting her pilot's license, she died in a tragic air mishap. While flying a lap at the third annual Boston Aviation Meet in her brand new uh, Blero monoplane, the plane unexpectedly pitched forward in the sky, dumping her and her passenger. They fell over a thousand feet to their desk below. The plane, however, would glide down and land in a muddy field unharmed. The next women I want to talk about also have ties to Michigan. 
Um, they are the Stinson family. They were a whole family of aviators. Now the two daughters, Catherine and Marjorie Stinson were the most well-known and they were beloved by the American public and believe it or not, the US military. They originally started in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, yes, they were acquainted with the Wright brothers <laughs> and Catherine was the daredevil. She was setting records in aerobatic maneuvers, such as the first woman to make a complete loop in the sky, and she would go on to complete 500 loops over her career without mishap. She also set the distance and endurance records, including the first woman to fly at night, the first to be licensed in a Wright biplane, and the first sky rider. During World War I, her and her sister were the only women that were allowed to fly the airmail for the US Army. During the war, she flew a Curtis JN-4, also known as a Jenny, in air shows around the nation to raise money for the American Red Cross. Her sister, Marjorie, was more focused on instruction, working as a teacher at the Stinson School of Flying, founded by their mother, Emma. Both sisters taught there, but in 1915, Marjorie was the only woman accepted into the U.S. Aviation Reserve Corps, which and was the first person, both male or female, to teach the US Army how to use parachutes. So she was the main instructor for parachute training uh, for the United States Army. In the 1920s, their brother Edward started the Stinson Aircraft Syndicate and began manufacturing airplanes. Detroit, of course, was the perfect city to set up shop and the location of his syndicate is now the Detroit Metro Airport. So if you've ever flown out of Detroit Metro, you've fl flown out of a pretty uh, historic uh, airfield. The most well-known Stinson aircrafts, of course, are the Stinson Detroit liner because, well, Detroit. So anyway, the company was bought out after Edward's death in a plane accident. Now these and several other women in the early 19 teens would set the scene for our Birmingham aviators to hit the runway. Now I told you that it was, it was the story of Roberta Rowe telling us about her, telling us about her, uh, let me get next slide, telling us about her mother, Edna. And I just wanna point out that Edna's the little girl standing on the chair. Um, I love this picture. She's absolutely adorable, but she was the only child and she was born to John and Emma Ferguson, uh, Emma Chissis Ferguson. That's the mom standing next to her. Now, John's family had settled into Birmingham in the mid 1800s and Emma's family settled in Birmingham and married into the Bingham family. Um, actually, Edna was a first cousin to Evelyn Chissis Bingham. And you might recognize this name, Alex Bingham, uh, our city clerk. Well, she's Edna's great grandmother. So, or Edna's, uh, I'm sorry, Evelyn's great granddaughter. <laughs> uh, so Edna was uh, a, a aunt to her. Now, while most of the Ferguson families stayed in Birmingham, John moved Edna and her mother to Southfield. Though Edna did not actually live in Birmingham, her and her family maintained an intimate connection to Birmingham through these family connections with the Chisesses and the Binghams um, and also the Fergusons. So these families go uh, quite well into the 20th century. Now, Edna's story, and this is her as uh, a young woman. Um, we were told that this is like her, her senior picture. Uh, from high school. Edna's story actually intertwines with another aviator that you may recognize, Harry Brooks. If you don't, Harry Brooks was Henry Ford's test pilot and he was quite famous uh, during this time period. Uh, he had a friendship with Charles Lindbergh that was well known. Now, Harry's parents also had a farm in Southfield, but they had deep connections here with Birmingham. And when he was younger, Harry attended Hill School and went to church in Birmingham. Now, if you know Birmingham and Southfield during the turn of the 19th century, um, there was really no central Southfield. It was mostly just farms. So Birmingham was kind of the area where everybody went shopping, they went to school, they went to church. 
Um, and then the farms were just, you know, a little bit further south. Uh, most of them were no more than two to three miles away. So even though they technically lived in Southfield, they spent most of their time uh, in Birmingham and were basically considered Birminghamers. Um, but anyway, uh, Harry was about six years older than, than uh, Edna and they were actually connected by family. So Edna's mother, Emma, had a younger brother, Robert Chizis, and he was younger by 12 years. And he married Harry's older sister, Gladys, who was older than Harry by five years. So there, there, there was like massive age difference between, um, even though Harry and Edna we're close to the same age. The way the brothers and the sisters were married is just there, there's big age gaps there. So it's it's always fun to try and draw these uh, genealogies if you ever have done so with these large families with wide spans. But Robert and Gladys lived on Maple Road by the Birmingham train station. Now at this time, the train station was actually located at the northwest corner of what is now new Woodward, so just regular Woodward and Maple. At the time it was actually train tracks, there was no road there. Um, basically, if you think of where the Hunter House Hamburgers is in the parking lot, um, that's where the train station was. And the family uh, lived pretty much, they said, you know, pretty much next to it. So kind of like in what is now the, the, the business area. But, um, as for Harry's inspiration for flight, Harry was nine years old when he saw the Wright brothers in 1911 perform at the Michigan State Fair. He was so inspired as a young boy that he went home and he built an airplane, um, <laughs> but he could not get an engine for it. So he had to wait till he graduated high school and then he began taking flying lessons. At this time, Edna's father, uh, because they were family, mowed a landing strip on the farm, which allowed Harry and his friends to fly in and visit. Now, according to Edna's daughter, Roberta, Edna began flying when she was 15. And of course, Harry was about 21, two years after he started flying. So they were flying together. Now, even though Harry and Edna were considered family, they were not blood related in any way. Um, because of just the family connections. They were not related in blood in any way. So they started dating. Um, and we're not sure actually when Harry and Edna started dating, but we do know that they both had a passion for flying. Um, here, is, here is a picture of Edna and Harry. So Harry's sitting um, on top uh, by the wing and Edna's in the cockpit there. But um, this is uh, Harry and Edna in her Curtis JN4, another Jenny. So these were the planes that were flown during World War I by army pilots. Um, of course, during World War I, they were army because the Air Force had not yet been formed. But these are the type of planes that became very popular for civilians after the war ended. Now, in this photograph, we're told that Edna was about 16 years old. When Harry and Edna dated, Harry used uh, Henry Ford's personal Lincoln to drive her around. And according to Edna's family, they were eventually engaged. But uh, Harry's parents were not so very happy about this engagement. Um, he was becoming quite famous as Henry Ford's test pilot. He was being talked about just like the char you know, Charles Lindbergh. He actually flew Charles Charles Lindbergh's mother to Mexico as a favor. So, you know, he was he was getting pretty famous and his family was not eager for him to like get married and settle down. They wanted to see how much further he could go. However, sadly, uh, the engagement was broken up by tragedy, not family. On February 25th, 1928, Harry Brooks was killed while doing a test run in the Ford Fliver off the coast of Florida. His body uh, was never found. On March 8th, all of Birmingham was shut down. All businesses were closed from 1.30 to 3.30. 
and all flags were flown at half mass so that all of Birmingham could attend Harry Brooks Memorial Service, which was held at the Birmingham Theater. The entire family was present, along with many celebrities, and Edna was just 19 years old when Harry was killed. Um, she, of course, was very devastated, and according to her family, she hung up her wings and she never took to the skies again. Um, so the article that you're looking at uh, begins with parents of Birmingham flyers stricken with grief. Plunge followed setting new record. And the quote under the picture reads, this close up of the famous Southfield aviator, Harry J. Brooks was taken before he hopped off on his ill-fated Miami trip. The smile is one that Birmingham people are familiar with. Now, this, this idea that uh, Birmingham was very familiar with this flyer. And I think it's funny to note that they did say he was a Birmingham aviator, but a Southfield pilot. But um, one of the stories that we have is actually from Alex Bingham, our, our city clerk. Her great, great grandfather has a uh, oral history with us. And he states that uh, Harry flew his plane over Birmingham so frequently that he actually installed speakers so that he could call out to his friends on the ground. Uh, when Charlie was just a young boy, uh, he heard Harry call out to his father from the plane. And he was so excited about the fact that his father was called out um, that he remembered it his whole life. It was one of those you know, defining moments in his childhood. Now, Edna would eventually move on from Harry's death and she married a Russell Burns in 1932. Edna had two children, including her daughter, Roberta, the one that gave us all this wonderful information. And according to Roberta, her mother took her to a private airfield in Birmingham and they would watch the planes land and take off. Now you're probably asking what landing strip in Birmingham? Well, back then any mode strip was counted um, so we don't really know the location specifically. Um, it was probably one of the area farms uh, that had a, a strip mown in it, just like her father had mown a strip for Harry to land in. But Roberta did say in a decade, in an article decades later, quote, it was awesome to see. There was something romantic when they took off and when they landed. I wondered where they were going and where they had been. Now, it would be many, many more years before Roberta took up flying herself. And during that time, Birmingham saw many other brave women take to the sky. So from this story of Edna, we were just like, well, is there other aviators in Birmingham? And we found quite a few. So I wanna describe the 99s first to understand uh, the next few women that are going to be coming up in Birmingham. But the 99s, uh, were actually founded by 99 women, and that's the, the, why the name. But in 1929, women pilots were taking to the skies all over the world. Uh, Amelia Earhart was becoming famous across the globe, and women wing walkers were expected at every air show. Several women decided to create an association to help facilitate women on their journey to becoming pilots. And then Amelia Earhart, uh, who almost everybody knows, and of course, Marjorie Stinson, who we talked about earlier, along with 97 other women from around the world, founded the 99s. It is an international organization for women pilots. Uh, Amelia Earhart would be their first president, and she helped lead the group to become a driving force behind women's aviation. Uh, the 99s, with the 99s help, uh, encouragement and support women in the aviation field, including many of Birmingham's women, felt at ease taking to the skies. So here we have two pictures um, of Amelia Earhart mixing uh, with her new 99s. And that brings us the 99s to Wilma Farah and Marge Ashton. Now, Many Birmingham women were actually pilots and most were part of the 99s. The group organized all kinds of activities and the magazine 99 News, oh, that is a tongue twister, uh, kept the women pilots in the know. Two Birmingham women were frequently mentioned in the news, including Wilma and Marge. Wilma was the contact for the Powder Power Puff 
Derby's here in Michigan. And Marge Ashton was an accident prevention counselor for the US Department of Transportation. So these women were quite high up in, in aviation. Uh, one program that Marge set up was actually a big hit. Uh, pilots were offered a chance to fly with pilots from the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to test their own reactions to the mental and physical effects of a high altitude and decompression sickness. At 29,000 feet, uh, the pilots took off their air masks to experience hypoxia firsthand. Hypoxia is the lack of oxygen. Now this was done so that these pilots could recognize the symptoms and limitations before they got too dangerous, should something happen during an actual flight. Uh, so th this was actually an important training. Um, the picture above here, this, this picture here, shows Marge Ashton in the middle of a group of Michigan 99s, and they are in front of her Cessna 320 Sky Knight. So that's her plane there. Um, now, the next person I want to talk about is Jane Briggs Hart. You probably recognize the name Briggs if you uh, have been in Birmingham for a length of time. Uh, Jane Briggs Hart and her family uh, still have, but definitely had strong ties to Birmingham from the very beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Jane's father was the early industrious, industrialist Walter O. Briggs, and the family is responsible for many buildings that we recognize today in Birmingham, including the Briggs Building that sits on the southeast corner of Maple and Old Woodward. Uh, it actually houses the Lululemon right now. Um, and they also were the builders of the Birmingham Theater on South uh, Old Woodward. So the same Birmingham Theater uh, that Harry Brooks's memorial was held in. Now the Briggs family also helped found the Detroit Zoo and they also provided significant funding to the Detroit Symphony Orchestra and the DIA. So a pretty important family here in Birmingham and in Detroit. Now, Jane Briggs Hart, I, and I just wanna point out this picture. I love this picture of her because she's getting ready to fly a, a powder puff derby that went 2,366 miles from Louisiana to Flint, Michigan. And this photo was taken in 1956 and she had just had a baby three weeks earlier. So um, if I could have looked like that <laughs> after three weeks, <laughs> but anyway, as a young woman, uh, Jane earned her pilot's license at 18, and she joined the 99s. She also was a captain in the Civil Air Patrol. Now, the Civil Air Patrol was the official civilian auxiliary of the U.S. Air Force, uh, which was formed during World War II to help keep the U.S. borders safe. Uh, so she did help serve um, during the time of need. Now, in 1943, Jane married Philip Hart and they made Birmingham their home. While in Birmingham, Jane uh, was very involved, of course, in flying and in the 99s, but she was also a member and a delegate to conventions for the Birmingham League of Women Voters. And she remained a member in the Birmingham League uh, even after they left for Lansing. Um, now in this photo, like I said, Jane is getting ready to fly in a powder power puff derby. And you might be wondering, why powder puff? What is the meaning of that? Well, the name came from a man who was trying to make fun of a group of women back in the 1930s by calling them powder puffs, uh, you know, the makeup powder puffs. Um, but the women decided to take that name and use it as their own. And uh, sometimes they use powder, sometimes they use power puff. So it just depended on who was writing the article. But uh, yeah, so this is her getting ready for that, that Powerpuff Derby. Um, now, Jane just didn't stop with flying airplanes. She also became the first woman uh, in Michigan to earn her helicopter rating. Um, and there was a reason why she, she did this. So she was married for 11 years when her husband was elected Michigan's Lieutenant Governor in 1954. 
Uh, the Hart family, which consisted of nine children, sadly, she did lose uh, one little boy as a toddler. So uh, only eight made it to, to adulthood. But uh, they moved to Lansing to be closer to uh, the lieutenant governorship. Um, but they maintained ties, definitely, through family to Birmingham. And so she would become the first woman to earn a license to fly helicopters. And of course, she had to then join the Whirly Girls also uh, on top of the 99s, uh, which were a group of women helicopter pilots. Uh, of course, one of the reasons why having that uh, helicopter license uh, was beneficial is that she flew her husband <laughs> to and from all the rallies and events uh, for his campaigns. So she decided not only to join him, but she also flew him uh, to these rallies and events. Um, however, she did receive a lot of criticism in political circles for this, um, not just for piloting the helicopter, but even for how she looked. Um, at the very first rally, uh, when she jumped out of the cockpit of the helicopter, she was wearing khaki shorts. This did not go over well with the political elite. Um, but really, Jane was not one to rest on convention. Uh, she did what she wanted, and she did not really care what was expected by society. Uh, you know, if you're going to uh, do what she did next, you really have to not care what society thinks. So not only was Jane interested in the civil rights and the equal rights uh, for women movements, uh, she was also one of the founders of the National Organization for Women. Um, when she was 40, she decided to participate in a program uh, at the Lovelace Clinic in New Mexico. And these were tests that basically uh, were the same physical and psychological tests administered to the Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, this was a privately financed project to test women to see if they could enter NASA's astronaut training program. Um, so even though congressional wives at this time, um, because her husband would be uh, become a senator, were expected to be ornamental, <laughs> Jane was not going to be an ornament. Anyway, she and 12 other women made the cut and they became known as the Mercury 13. Now, NASA, however, continued to insist that only qualified test pilots could enter its astronaut program and refused to admit women until 1978. Uh, this, of course, is the class that included Sally Ride, who would become the first woman in space in 1983. But it wasn't just, oh, well, you have to become a pilot or a qualified test pilot. Um, Jane and several other women actually had to take their fight to Congress to allow women to enter the, the astronaut program. Uh, and what you're seeing the picture here is Jane and Jerry Cobb, another one of the Mercury 13. So Jane is all the way to the left um, and Jerry is to the right. But um, they're here posing with the Saturn rocket on March 13th, two days before meeting with Lyndon B. Johnson uh, to discuss uh, the problematics with women not being allowed in NASA. Um, she took this, they took this to the US Congress. Uh, and uh, as you can see, here they are uh, being interviewed uh, on July 17th and 18th in 1962 in front of the US uh, Congress at the Special Subcommittee on the Selection of Astronauts. Um, now, they argued that uh, as they could pass all the same tests, and in some cases with better scores than the men, they should be allowed into the space program. Uh, as Jerry Cobb says, we seek only a place in our nation's space future without discrimination. It would be 20 years after this talk in Congress before women would be allowed to enter. But even, even though uh, they, they didn't win technically, uh, you know, it would take 20 years to win. Uh, after this fight, she decided not to stop fighting and uh, she would participate in protests against the Vietnam War. She was even arrested during a protest in Washington. 
Um, her husband did not always agree with her politics. He also did not always agree with her approach to the issues. But the one thing he always did was support her right to do what she wanted to do. That could not have been easy for a senator, but it was Jane Hart Briggs. She did what she wanted. So good for her. Um, now, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, women, uh, Jane Briggs Hart uh, in, the, in, in World War II, but there were other women who participated uh, during World War II uh, including Jane Elizabeth Alexander. And this here is a write-up from June uh, 1942 in the Birmingham, Set in Birmingham Eccentric. Now, she was actually a student pilot during World War II um, when she decided that she wanted to work with the Sperry Gyroscopic Precision Instrument. Now, a gyroscope, and I had to look this up because I am not mathematically inclined or flight inclined, but it is an instrument used to provide stability or maintain a reference direction in navigation systems. Uh, this leads to automatic pilots and stabilizers. So, you know, wow, uh, very smart woman. But she graduated at the head of her class and though in the article published, Jane does state that the quote, men students did not make her tasks easier. But after graduation, she decided that she was going to work in the instrument department on the West Coast. And for specific reasons, they did not say, they basically said for an unspecified airplane plant. So this is world during World War II, they couldn't actually name that plant. So we don't really know where she worked at this time. But our next, our next uh, our world woman in World War II is Patricia Barbara Ramsey James. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is the best photo that we have of her. Um, she was not actually born in Birmingham, uh, but her family moved here when she was in her late teens. Um, by 1944, she had a degree in mathematics, and during World War II, she decided to fly planes for the manufacturing plants to military bases. After the war was over, she did try fa modeling, fashion modeling in New York City. I mean, she is beautiful. Um, but then she decided to try ranching in South Dakota. Eventually, she found her way back to Michigan where she earned her PhD at MSU in mathematics. Um, and she also got married to her third husband here in Birmingham. Um, she was definitely um, filled with wanderlust. <laughs> she did become the first woman to lead the University of Buffalo computer science department and, one, as what, and was one of the nation's very first women computer scientists. So another very intelligent woman. Um, though her flying career lasted only during World War II, her contributions to the U.S. and women aviators was significant. We cannot confirm that she was a WAFS, which is the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, um, or of the Women Air Force Service Pilots, known as WASPs. We do know that most women who flew the military planes from the manufacturers to the military Terry bases were part of these organizations. About 80% of them were WAFS. We can't actually find her service records, but we do know uh, just through things that we, we found from her family that she uh, flew these uh, from the manufacturing plants to military bases. Um, now, these women would free up over 900 male pilots to serve overseas in combat. Uh, and though these women did not see battle, 38 were killed while serving their country, flying these planes. Um, these women not just ferried planes, but they also tested them to make sure that they were actually airworthy. So very brave women, very brave women, knowing that they, you know, if this, they're, they're making sure the planes don't crash before handing them over to the men who are going to fly them overseas. Um, so kudos to these women. Um, our next woman. Uh, actually went to Groves. So this is Lieutenant Allison Webster Giddings. Uh, 
she was another Birmingham aviator and she went to Groves High School and she graduated here in Birmingham. Um, she was a varsity athlete and she was a top student. She earned the Naval Academy. Uh, she entered the Naval Academy after high school and became a CH-460 Sea Knight helicopter pilot. Uh, you can see one of those planes uh, there in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and of course, Allison is getting into one of those helicopters uh, just below. But in 1991, she was one of only 200 women pilots in the US Navy. Uh, and of course, in an interview, she credits her success uh, with the Naval Academy uh, to the training that she received in her high school sports at Groves, uh, including basketball and baseball. So yay, Groves. <laughs> uh, kudos to you for raising such wonderful, wonderful uh, men and women. Uh, so here she here's another shot of that SHC King. Um, when researching these helicopters, it's it's really amazing because they have to these ships are on the open sea and they're moving up and down and up and down and up and down. So landing on these, uh, whether in an airplane or a helicopter, um, it's it's some it's a tricky business. Uh, I was reading up on it and I was I was quite amazed. Um, so she actually received several awards uh, for her service and recognitions during her career as a pilot, including receiving the Outstanding Women in Aviation Award in 1991. And she's also credited with saving the lives of her crew when after losing an engine on her helicopter, she was actually able to pilot it safely um, to land. And uh, apparently that is not an easy thing to do. But uh, she stated in the article in All Hands, which is a uh, military uh, magazine, they did a whole entire article on her. That's where I got these pictures from, uh, All Hands. Uh, it was that she wanted to become a test pilot and an instructor when she was done with her service. Well, she actually did both. Uh, she is currently a research engineer at the Naval Academy uh, and she also uh, works at Vanderbilt University. Uh, so she, she's doing everything that she loved and what she wanted to become. So now we're going to come back to the Fergusons. So, Roberta Rowe, this is a picture of her landing at Meg's airfield. This was taken by her daughter uh, as they were getting ready for approach. So this is three generations of, of Ferguson women. Uh, Roberta would uh, get her license after raising a family. Um, uh, after raising a family, she remembered that airstrip that her mother uh, would take her to as a young child. Uh, she remembered the romance and the, the you know, the wonderment. Um, and she decided after she started working at the physics and astronomy department at the University of Iowa um, that she wanted to get her pilot's license. It, it, it inspired her uh, to, to go and get her training. Um, now, the, her landing at uh, Chicago Meg's airfield uh, is right on the shores of Lake Mich Michigan. And one, it was when planes could still, when it was still an operating airport, um, it was one of the most challenging uh, airfields to land at, um, not just because of where it was located, but also because of the nearby air traffic at O'Hare National International Airport. Uh, and Midway Airport. So it's like right in between, right on the water. Um, as Rose says in her article, I had to fly low because of the planes going into O'Hare. Then the controller said, sailboat mast ahead. And I had to do a helicopter landing to go over the mast and then land. 
her daughter was like, well, it was just really neat to see the skyline from that height. So while her mother's trying to do these weird maneuvers over sailboat masts, which is probably something most pilots don't have to worry about, uh, her daughter was inspired more about the skyline. Now her daughter uh, would end up becoming a pilot too. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. It's three generations of pilots. So Roberta Ferguson Rowe, uh, after she got her uh, pilot's license, uh, she joined the 99s and she ended up uh, becoming the editor and publisher for the 99 News, the magazine that was started back in 1929. Um, in 1993, she also started uh, uh, the magazine Woman Pilot. You can see the, the front cover of the first issue there. Uh, it was a magazine that was printed for and about women pilots. She continued publishing until 2002 uh, when she had to go to an all online format. And she continued publishing, but just not in paper. Um, in in 20, 2017, Roberta was awarded the President's Award in recognition for her contributions to women's aviation, both in the air and on the ground. Um, so, you know, when we were talking to Roberta, it was, it was so wonderful to sit and, and listen to the things that she had to say about her mother. Now, here is a picture of, uh, Kelsey, her daughter and Roberta. So, uh, Kelsey is to the left and Roberta is in blue to the right. Uh, Roberta's daughter and Edna's granddaughter uh, Kelsey also decided to carry on the family tradition and she became a pilot, as I said earlier. And in an interview, Susan uh, Rowe Kelsey said that the first time she flew with her mother, she felt a sense of pride. She was quoted as saying, I kept thinking, wow, that's my mom over there. <laughs> so in the pilot seat. Um, so it was definitely an experience. Um, now, I do want to say that this talk would have never happened if it not for Roberta coming to us with this wonderful story about her mother, Edna, and how she was Birmingham's very first woman pilot. Uh, the story of her romance with Harry Brooks is both inspiring and heartbreaking. Now, this talk was going to be part of our 2020 celebration of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, but Due to the pandemic, it had to be postponed. Sadly, at the beginning of 2021, Roberta Rowe passed away. Um, and she's not able to be a part of this talk. However, her family came to us this summer and they brought us some wonderful things from her and from the Ferguson farm dating back to the 1850s and 1860s. And they told us more about these wonderful three generations of women pilots that grace their family. So now I do want to remind you um, that April 7th, April 7th, Birmingham, America Shetland Pony Capital with Caitlin Donnelly is going to happen here, at the Baldwin Library, whether it's Zoom or in person, we still don't know yet. So keep a lookout for that. But uh, you definitely want to learn about the ponies. Um, the story is a wonderful story. And if you like ponies and who doesn't like ponies, it's definitely worth a watch. So now I'm gonna uh, hand it over to you. Does anybody have any questions uh, about the women aviators of Birmingham? You can always add your questions into the chat too, folks, if you feel more comfortable with that. Um, I'm monitoring the chat if you have any questions feel free to put them there or unmute yourself and ask Donna. Are you aware of any current day women pilots from the area? Uh, unfortunately, no, I am not. Um, it's kind of, difficult to like if I want to uh, search pilots after 2001 um, a lot of that information was removed. Um, I actually flew 
Uh, several times I was actually in training to get my own pilot's license in, in 2000, 2001. Uh, and unfortunately they shut everything down, locked everything up and searching uh, individual pilots now is not like it used to be, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and I will tell you, yes, flying um, in, in one of those little aircrafts is just absolutely wonderful. Um, if you ever get a chance, uh, take it uh, and you'll understand why uh, these women just had to go, why they just had to, had to fly. It's, it's, it's an inspiring experience. Any other questions? Donna, I'm curious, how did um, it come to be that um, Miss Rowe and her family brought you the, her, her, the story? Was it? Because they were from Birmingham, they knew about Harry Brooks and we have a lot on Harry Brooks, actually. We do, we have done um, stories, uh, newspaper articles. Um, if you've ever been on our Twitter, uh, if you don't, if you're not on our Twitter, you have to join the Birmingham Museum Twitter. Uh, uh, it's Caitlin's voice, which is the best. Uh, you will love our Twitter. Uh, Harry Brooks is featured uh, on the Twitter, uh, featured on the Facebook here and there. And Roberta reached out to us after coming across one of these um, one of these uh, social media posts and was like, Hey, I got some information for you. <laughs> so yeah, we're always, you, you know, it, it, as the question did ask, are you aware of any current day women pilots? If you're a current day woman pilot and you want to tell us your story, please get a hold of me, um, get a hold of the Birmingham Museum. Uh, we want to hear your stories. Um, so yeah, she just reached out to us and said, Hey, I've got a story for you. And and it turned into this huge, wonderful uh, research project where we were we able to dig out and find a lot more information about women we didn't know about that definitely deserve to be talked about. Thanks, that's fascinating. <laughs> so any other questions? I know these end up on your YouTube page, correct? Yes. For anyone who missed them? Yes. So okay. if you're watching from YouTube, hi. <laughs> <laughs> for for a sub, oh, uh, super interesting. Thanks for the research. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I know every so often at the library, we'll get um, calls or emails, usually the day or two after these uh, for folks who did miss them. Um, uh -huh. You About how long is it? like maybe a week or so, like when can we direct folks who may have missed this talk uh, to your YouTube page? Roughly? It's usually about a week or so, yeah. So, okay. yeah, but, um, you know, they can always, uh, uh, they can always visit our YouTube page and, and uh, watch all of our other awesome videos <laughs> while they wait for this one to pop up because we have uh, quite a few uh, from other talks that we've had and yeah, so. Awesome, great. We got a lot of thanks in the chat. Aw, thank you. <laughs> I guess his thanks. <laughs> so any other, any other questions? Sounds like no. So okay. should we wrap it up? I think we'll wrap it up here if nobody has any other questions. Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining me tonight uh, and uh, joining uh, with the Birmingham Museum and the Baldwin Library. Uh, don't forget, Caitlin, April 7th, ponies. Who, who can say no to ponies? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll see you uh, at our next talk. Great. Right. Good, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.